Hello, my name is Danielle Aubert. I'm the president of AAUPAFT Local 6075. In this presentation, I will review recent developments in the School of Medicine that have taken place since the arrival of the new Dean in 2020. As I'm new in my role as union president, I believe it's critical for me to share information with our members from the perspective of the union, but also to find opportunities to hear from members so that I have confidence that we are not misreading the situation and that we're working together to respond. At the end of 2019, there was a sense of cautious optimism at the School of Medicine. University Physicians Group had come out of bankruptcy, been rebranded as Wayne Health, and was being represented in the press as having turned a corner in terms of its financial health. Meanwhile, between 2011 and 2019, there was a huge increase in the amount of extramural research funding brought in by faculty in the School of Medicine. Some of this increase had to do with an accounting change that took place in 2016, but nonetheless, funding was way up. During this same time, the number of faculty dropped. Between 2013 and 2019, the total number of faculty members had dropped 19% from 686 to 554. The number of faculty today in the school is 456. That's a 33% drop since 2013. Despite this, the amount of research grant funding being brought in by faculty is way up. Contrary to anyone who talks about dead weight or dead wood or unproductive faculty, research faculty have definitely been pulling their weight and then some, even as their numbers have gone down. If we look at the overall budget for faculty and academic staff salaries in the School of Medicine, you'll see that these numbers have barely changed. The faculty salary budget went up 0.6% from 2019 to 2020. The total academic staff, grad assistant, and part-time faculty salary pool only went up about $100,000 from 2019 to 2020. What did change very noticeably was the budget for non-academic salaries, which include administrator salaries. This number jumped $4 million, or 49.5%. It was in this context that Dr. Mark Schweitzer began his term as Dean of the School of Medicine in April, 2020. But within months of his arrival, it was clear that Dean Schweitzer was not going to be collaborative. One of his first actions was to cut the salaries of clinical faculty, despite the fact that the finances at both the school and the practice plans were apparently in better shape than they had been for years. Clinicians were notified that in their new contracts, their Wayne State employment would be cut 50% to 0.5 FTE or 0.5 full-time employment at the minimum salary for their rank. We have long had minimum salary tables in our collective bargaining agreement, but they had never before been used in this way. Clinicians saw their Wayne State salaries drop from an average of around 134,000 per year to $35,000. They were told they could make up the difference in their salaries by seeing more patients at Wayne Health. A major concern from the point of view of the union is that this shifts the balance in the direction of Wayne Health, a practice plan that despite PR about it being financially healthy is very newly out of bankruptcy. School of Medicine clinicians receive union negotiated retirement benefits and vacation accrual for the Wayne State portion of their salaries only. While clinician Wayne State salaries are fixed, the Wayne Health portion is dependent on how many patients a clinician can see and employment is at will. A person can lose their job on short notice. With this new structure, clinicians are pressured to see more patients faster to bring in more revenue. But let's not forget that they are clinical educators. Having such a small portion of their salary come from Wayne State devalues the important pedagogical work that they're doing as educators. It also diminishes the critical work that clinical faculty do in research and service for the university. Furthermore, by many accounts, Wayne Health is poorly managed. In order for our clinicians and by extension Wayne Health to succeed, it needs to be well managed by people who value clinical excellence. A lot of back office work has been outsourced. There is a lack of transparency around billing and records. Altogether, it is becoming harder and harder for clinicians to be successful without adequate support staff and good management. The union filed a grievance in the fall of 2020 to fight back against these cuts on the grounds that the dean and other university administrators do not have the authority to arbitrarily and unilaterally reduce FTE, salary, and benefits. 
Last month, however, we withdrew the grievance. Grievances are limited by the constraints of our collective bargaining agreement. And after internal discussion and consultation with legal counsel, we withdrew just prior to arbitration because we did not think this particular grievance would prevail. But this issue is not closed and we're continuing to look at other approaches. While cuts to clinical educators were taking place, the Dean also took aim at research faculty salaries. He formed a committee to restructure research and instructed committee members to keep discussions confidential. This committee was formed outside of regular faculty governance structures and raised concerns because of the air of secrecy associated with it. At the same time, the Dean spoke in several forums about his intention to cease hiring in basic science departments. One reason this is consequential is that research faculty in basic science departments are fully tenured. Research faculty in clinical departments are only eligible for 50% tenure. Ceasing hiring into basic science departments means that no new hires in the School of Medicine will be eligible for full tenure. Starting in late fall 2020, there were a number of chair and vice dean departures. Dr. J.P. Jin, chair of physiology, left to join the faculty at the University of Illinois Chicago. The dean, without consulting the faculty of the physiology department, replaced Dr. Jin with an interim chair. Our collective bargaining agreement requires that faculty are consulted when replacing a chair. In March of 2021, Dr. Tsvedi Markova, chair of family medicine, was removed from her position. Dr. Markova was respected and well-liked by faculty in her department. She has a national reputation as an expert in graduate medical education and had just received an outstanding five-year review as chair. She has since been named Chief Integration Officer at Medical University of South Carolina. She was replaced by an interim chair, this time in consultation with faculty in the department. Dr. Herb Smitherman was removed from his position as Vice Dean for Diversity and Community Affairs. Dr. Smitherman has a 30-year career at Wayne State, is nationally recognized, and led efforts to respond to diversity and inclusion citations that emerged from the LCME accreditation process. He's responsible for dramatically improving diversity in recruitment of medical students to the school. He's been replaced with Donovan Roy from Western Michigan University. Dr. Richard Baker, Vice Dean of Medical Education, left Wayne State. He had come in 2015 from UCLA and was largely responsible for restructuring the curriculum in the wake of LCME accreditation challenges. He has been replaced with Robert Folberg from Oakland University. Dr. Char Dong Shu, chair of OBGYN, left Wayne State to chair the OBGYN department at the University of Arizona. He was replaced with an interim chair. Last fall, Dr. Ray Mattingly was the fourth chair in a year to leave the Wayne State School of Medicine. Meanwhile, in January of 2021, the union entered into bargaining for the first time in eight years. Representatives from the School of Medicine were present on both sides of the negotiating table. The union negotiating team was prepared for the subject of School of Medicine research faculty salaries or research restructuring in some form to come up, but it did not. The new contract was ratified on September 22nd. There were many important wins for us in the contract, but one thing we agreed to was that to help the university, we would not take salary increases in the first year of the contract and only small 2% and 2.25% increases in the second and third years of the contract. Many of us were extremely frustrated when a week later, the university administration announced it would give 2% across the board raises to all non-represented employees, including all administrators. Last fall, research faculty were informed that they're now required to fund a minimum of 30% of their salary on federal grant submissions if they are the principal investigator and 10% if they are a co-investigator. This policy is in direct violation of NIH regulations, which state that salary on grants shall reflect the scientific effort committed by the investigator. Many grant mechanisms do not provide sufficient funding to allow such policies to be followed. This policy restricts faculty's academic freedom to engage in certain types of research based purely on budgetary considerations. <clears throat> on November 10th, seven weeks after the close of bargaining, I received notice that the Dean of the School of Medicine now intends to restructure the salaries of research faculty. The term restructure is a euphemism for pay cut. The notice read that 
there will be a graduated reduction in research faculty effort down to their contractual tenure percent with consideration of salary support from grants. All research faculty will be maintained at a minimum of 50% FTE in order to retain benefits. More productive faculty will receive a to be determined bonus. Basically, the Dean is proposing to cut salaries so that he can then offer incentives to bring them back up. The union has not entered into discussion or negotiation on these proposed cuts because we object to both the framing of this discussion as well as the timing. First, to tie a person's tenure to their FTE is extremely problematic. FTE refers to a person's full-time employment status. We should not start conflating FTE and tenure. This can have far-reaching consequences beyond the School of Medicine. Second, if we enter into negotiations now, what does this say about the collective bargaining process? We signed a new contract on September 22nd. Seven weeks later, we are told the School of Medicine would like to reopen discussions to negotiate major structural changes to the way that faculty members are paid. What, conditioned, what conditions changed in the intervening seven weeks? The timing suggests that the administration actually waited until the end of negotiations to introduce this plan. On December 21st, I received another message now specifying the plan would be that basic scientists, both in basic science and clinical departments, would have their FTE reduced down to the tenure base. There's no such thing as tenure base in the collective bargaining agreement. Even if your letter of employment refers to some portion of your salary being tenure protected, you should be aware that a letter of employment is not the same as a contract. Terms like tenure base, tenure protected are being used to justify what are essentially pay cuts. This plan follows a troubling pattern where faculty and academic staff in the School of Medicine have less and less agency and the Dean has more and more authority over salaries. Right now, we are working closely with our legal counsel to determine how to, to respond if they try to carry out these cuts. We are also working with the healthcare division of our national union, the AFT. They've put a consultant at our disposal who has worked with medical schools across the country to tease out issues related to practice plans, research faculty, and all the revenue streams involved in running a school of medicine. We're reviewing school of medicine financials using public records and through information requests. We're, bu we're building a network of research and clinical faculty and academic staff within the school of medicine. We need members in every department who can share what is going on on the ground and help us form an accurate picture. If you are a faculty or academic staff member in the School of Medicine, the most important thing you can do right now is to become engaged in what's going on and help shine a light on it. If you're a member of the School of Medicine Budget Advisory Committee or a Budget Advisory Committee in your department, ask for financials. If you need help knowing what to ask for, we can help you formulate requests. We need the Dean and the University to release School of Medicine financial information to justify these cuts. Talk to your colleagues. If you're in a department that does not have a union rep, talk to us about how you can help us build an organizing structure in the school so we can respond more quickly when these kinds of things happen. If you hear of something or something happens to you, let your rep know or email the union office. If you're from main campus, help us demonstrate to our School of Medicine colleagues that they are not alone. It can often feel like main campus and the School of Medicine are worlds apart, but we need one another. The most immediate action we are asking of you if you're in the School of Medicine is to complete the survey that went out on January 13th. All faculty and academic staff in the school should have received an email from AAA, the American Arbitration Association, with a link to a five question survey. Complete the survey and be candid in your answers. It should take you about five minutes. The survey is just one way for us to gather information. It's completely anonymous. It's administered by a third party. And it's important for us as the union to be responsible to you, to have an accurate sense of your experience of the management of the school. We may share aggregated survey results and anonymous comments with members of the Board of Governors and other administrators and with you. If you do not, did not receive the survey or cannot find the email, send a message to office at aaupaft.org. And finally, none of us like to be engaging in conflict with the administration. We want a collaborative relationship and we want to be able to do our jobs to teach, to practice medicine, to research, to support and advise students. But we are in a critical moment in the school. And if we want to course correct, it's important that we come together and speak up. Thank you.